I am a, uh, I always start like this, I am probably one of the gloomiest people you have ever met, but I am also, according to Pauline, one of the, I think Pauline thinks I'm one of the wettest people on, on nuclear deterrence you will ever meet in the Conservative Party. I do not speak for the Conservative Party. Um, I am the chairman of the Defence Select Committee, and so I have the luxury of being able to ignore every party line in existence. Usually I don't know what it is. Um, and yet I, I said I was a gloomy sort of person. I believe in the end of the world. Um, this is my end of the world is nice speech. I think that despite all of the new threats that are arising all around us, economic meltdown, uh, Syrian chemical weapons, cyber destruction, I think the greatest threat that the world faces of all is nuclear proliferation. <coughs> because if a nuclear bomb goes off, we have no practice in how we react to it. We have uh, every likelihood of making a mistake in responding to it. And the real likelihood that I can see is that a nuclear bomb would go off, somebody else would respond, and then the world would rapidly become uninhabitable. I said I was a gloomy sort of person, and this is what I genuinely believe. Sorry about that. Um, having said that, you may be surprised at the conclusion that I reach in this brief comment. First, does nuclear deterrence actually work? Who are our nuclear weapons aimed at in the United Kingdom? They are aimed at states. Not much point in aiming a nuclear weapon at terrorist organizations, because you can never be entirely sure where they are. Um, so they're aimed at states. Presumably, they're aimed at rational states. Um, because if, if they're irrational, you would think that deterrence wouldn't be that effective because they were irrational. Um, and they're aimed at rational states who are not already deterred by the existence of the American and French nuclear deterrence. Now, that may be a contradiction in terms. Rational states not already deterred by the Americans. Uh, unless we're aiming, of course, our nuclear weapons at the Americans or the French. And I'll come on to that in a few moments. Um, so it's a fairly small target that we're aiming these nuclear weapons at. And yet it's going to cost quite a lot of money. Uh, we don't know how much it will cost. Those who want nuclear weapons say it will cost 20 billion pounds. Those who don't want them say it will cost 100 billion pounds. So let's say it will be somewhere between 20 and 100 billion pounds. Either way, most of, well, I certainly think quite a lot of money. Um, so do our nuclear weapons deter those who might use them against us? Um, my view is that any state wanting to attack us with a nuclear weapon would use a proxy, would use a terrorist organization at its beck and call and put a nuclear bomb in a container ship and sail it into Southampton. I've got nothing against Southampton, uh, but clearly if a nuclear bomb did go off in Southampton, we'd have some difficulty in working out who to retaliate against. And if we don't know who to retaliate against, how does deterrence work? This would lead most of you to think that I therefore feel we should not have a nuclear deterrent. But I don't think that. And the reason I don't think that is because the possession of nuclear weapons, even at the low level that we in the United Kingdom have our nuclear weapons, is it's a ghastly thing to say this, but it remains true it is one of the guarantors of our international influence. Um, and the reason I say that is that when South Africa 
unilaterally disarmed in a nuclear sense, it lost such influence as it had in international negotiations. Or certainly it reduced that influence. And I believe, ghastly as it is, our possession of a nuclear deterrent does help to maintain our influence. Um, it's not exactly a willy-waving contest, but it comes close to it. Uh, if you say that South Africa improved its moral authority by unilaterally nuclear disarming, I would suggest that countries like Iran and North Korea have absolutely no interest in moral authority. All they are interested in is physical authority. And while they are trying to build up their nuclear weapons, it would seem to me an odd time for us to reduce our influence and to get rid of the ultimate and the most ghastly weapon. Clearly, they believe in it. Um, and I said I would come back to the French. If we were to disarm ourselves uh, in the United Kingdom, we would be ceding leadership of defense in general in Europe to the French. Now, I don't think that the man in the street is ready for that yet. Polls have suggested that when asked the sensible questions, the man in the street says he wants to keep our nuclear weapons. So I am ambivalent about our nuclear deterrent. I think that in the end, nuclear weapons will bring an end to the world, and yet still, curiously enough, I want to keep it. And I'm going to tackle the, um, no, the examination question, which is, do nukes deter? And I'm not going to focus, at least at the beginning, on the UK, because uh, it seems to me there's a, a broader argument that we could uh, profit, profitably uh, think about. Uh, well, my answer is that, that um, nukes uh, have deterred, and I think consider they do still deter, and I think they will continue to deter in the future. That's not because I think that the world hasn't changed. I certainly do. And I wouldn't argue that uh, you know, nukes are all-purpose weapons. I mean, they don't deter terrorism, for instance, uh, and they don't deter a number of the threats that we now face. Uh, and they're not weapons for asymmetric warfare. But it doesn't follow uh, that because you know, those are some of the threats we face that they still don't have uh, a purpose. And my view, their purpose is really for the, for the prevention of what I could call big war. Um, now, a lot of people... Uh, no, it, and it also, secondly, I think, uh, possession of nuclear we weapons prevents the country from being successfully subjected to uh, nuclear blackmail. Now, if you believe that um, the only kind of threats we face are these uh, uh, lesser ones, um, and uh, if you also uh, believe um, that uh, in a non-nuclear world, it will be possible to keep all those lesser threats small and controllable, and I, in other words, without leading to big war, uh, then I think you could safely conclude, you know, that uh, we didn't really need uh, nuclear capability and it could be dismantled because I entirely agree they're uh, extremely, extremely nasty weapons that you want to seek not to have to use. Um, but you've also got to believe, I think, you know, in that sort of world, if you have, don't have th that this uh, total nuclear disarmament uh, is going to happen in our lifetime and not, you know, with the Greek calends, which I fear is the case. And also that reductions would be, and particularly if you believe reductions are zero, that they would be uh, verifiable. That's one of the conditions that uh, Henry Kissinger, you know, who is part of the global zero movement, uh, does say is absolutely indispensable to um, global zero. Um, well, I think tell that to the Iranians. Um, I think the chances of being able to get adequate verification of that sort of world is pretty low. So I don't really um, trust that future. Um, I think you also, and this is my second point really, um, that you ha also have to believe that in no, in no country in the future, you know, despite new political regime, uh, would seek to acquire uh, nuclear capability, you know, whatever the international agreements might say. Um, and one has to say that this technology uh, isn't actually particularly complicated or particularly unavailable these days. So I think that you know, it is, uh, it's capable of being acquired. Um, 
and you then have to believe, obviously, that in that situation, it's sensible for you and your allies, you know, to have um, dismantled your own capability. Well, uh, I don't think that that's a particularly attractive uh, scenario either. So I do take the view that um, uh, in the case of um, uh, that people also, sorry, people also, I think, uh, have come to assume this is a, a, a scenario that you hear quite widely canvassed is that, well, we aren't going to have, you know, big war in the future, uh, large conflicts. Uh, um, and that was something that only happened in the 20th century. Um, but I'm, it's not, I think, a safe assumption. I mean, for, for reasons that I've, I've um, uh, uh, spelled out, and one of the reasons why I think that um, it's necessary to keep the, um, keep, keep uh, nuclear weapons is, is because of their, their prevention of a big war role. Um, and I'm, I'm aware of the, you know, the so-called uh, stability-instability paradox, and that's to say that uh, in the Cold War, which I suppose people would regard as being the sort of locus classicus of, of deterrence, um, we managed to avoid big wars you know, at the price of smaller proxy wars being you know, fought out on the perimeter of, of the two ideological empires. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the um, thesis of those who you know, think that we no longer need them is that um, the multipolar, in a multipolar world, uh, that sort of stability between blocks uh, is no longer attainable. And that's a, no, that is a, it's a serious argument, which I mean, I, I do accept, complicates the situation. And that was uh, James' starting point, and it's, it's a good one. Um, but I don't come to conclusion, uh, therefore, that they don't have a role. Um, it's very clear that any role that they do have no, has to be in the context of a full-blown uh, strategy and a much wider military capability. And responsible deterrence you know, means that nuclear weapons on, are part of a wider balanced strategy and weapons capability. I don't believe clearly uh, that you can some, somehow uh, re rely on simply their possession and think that somehow you're, and not on that basis, you're likely to be a good uh, international citizen. So I don't think that is the case. Um, we've seen, have we not, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, much more resort to things like economic sanctions, uh, and that is for you know, good reasons. Um, and they've become much more usable than they were during the Cold War. And one of the things we might think about is, is Iran in that context, because it's undoubtedly going to be the test of successful economic sanctions in preventing conflict in the Middle East, which could be alarmingly big uh, if it fails. So uh, just to turn to this country for a moment, my two final points. Um, at this country has practiced, I think, what can certainly be called minimal deterrence, you know, just enough of an arsenal um, and just enough seriousness of purpose about the, um, the role that it has to make it credible, uh, and therefore to have uh, deterrent value. Um, and the danger, I think, for this country is that we drop below the threshold of credibility um, rather than that we um, you know, have too much capability. Um, I also think that for an, uh, a, a, a democracy, um, uh, it, it's very important that, that um, nuclear weapons should be regarded as part of an acceptable uh, strategy. And by an acceptable strategy, I mean essentially one that's defensive. Um, one can't be seen as a democracy to be in the game of playing with nuclear weapons for the purposes of uh, nuclear blackmail. Uh, if you're going to have uh, a uh, credible uh, stance uh, of a deterrent and defensive kind, it seems to me one has to have a second strike capability as to say a capacity not simply to attack, but to continue to defend when attacked. Otherwise, you know, why have them if you're only going to you'd be able to use them for attack? That's not a credible defensive strategy. Um, now, the UK you know, has now a single system, which is submarine-based, and I think I take the view that you know, for the purposes of a credible uh, second strike capability, we do have to have continuous uh, at-sea deployment. 
Otherwise, I think we are wasting our time, and I'm now getting, obviously, into the modalities of uh, what kind of deployment the UK should have. I also have to say I don't, don't believe in delivery systems that could be more vulnerable than the ones we have now, so I basically want to stick where uh, we are. It could be argued, obviously, that you know, Europe is now a zone of peace and that we can rely on extended deterrence, i.e. the Americans. Um, and that's another quite serious argument. But I think one needs to bear in mind a couple of things. First of all, don't forget the pivot. Um, and we Europeans are expected to do more, not less. And there's also the French point that uh, has been already made. And has anybody looked recently at the Russian build-up? Um, you know, Mr. Medvedev is actually, I think, a signatory to Global Zero. Um, but they are sure hanging on to quite a considerable uh, uh, arsenal of, of uh, tactical nuclear weapons. So what are those for, if they aren't for actually impressing the neighbors? And for these purposes, I think we are included in the neighbors. Two final points. First, on nuclear proliferation. I quite right to say, um, absolutely no disagreement between myself and James here, very, very important. We need to keep down the number of nuclear states and reduce nuclear holdings in existing nuclear states. I don't know how much further the UK can go without sort of dropping below a threshold, but certainly some of the larger ones can certainly be reduced. Um, and we also uh, need verification. The trouble with verification is it's not like so likely to happen in places where it's most needed, like North Korea and, and Pakistan, um, where, sadly, you know, uh, renunciation is not likely to be forthcoming uh, in the foreseeable future. And I don't believe the reductions can simply be a unilateral Western activity. It does have to be something that carries credibility on a global plane. The last thing I'd just say is I am not one of those who thinks that there will never be alternatives to nuclear weapons. That's to say that weapon development will not move on and that we shall never have a situation in uh, which nuclear weapons uh, might be obsolete. Um, I don't believe it's arrived yet. I mean, people look you know, rightly to things like uh, ABM defenses, but frankly, I think that we're so far from the numbers necessary you know, really to uh, keep the peace around the globe that way, or indeed, uh, we don't enough, know enough about their reliability uh, for us you know, to be able to say that somehow we can trust to moving to a system of that kind to replace uh, the deterrence which nuclear weapons provides. I'm tempted to try to answer, on behalf of the Russians to some degree, your question about why they want all of these tactical nuclear weapons. I think the answer from their perspective is the same answer that we would have given when we had lots of them, which was that there is a conventional imbalance. Um, and their answer to that conventional imbalance is to hold on to tactical nuclear weapons, at least until such times as we can find some way of addressing these conventional issues. Uh, the second point I want to make is the last time I was asked this question, the people who were with me had two days to answer it <laughs> at the Hoover Institute in the Stanford University. And then we didn't come up with a very convincing answer one way or another, I have to say, despite the fact that some of the best es experts in the world were present disaggregating and picking apart this argument. So I have about six minutes, which is why I've written down what I want to say, because I've lost my ability to be able to stay within time if I extemporize. So here we go. Uh, do nuclear weapons deter? Well, I mean, my view is the answer to that question is it's really a matter of judgment. Um, and my judgment at the moment is perhaps. Uh, but we cannot be certain that they did or that they do, and I'm less certain that they will continue to do so in the future. In logic, we cannot be certain that they did deter in the past. That a nuclear attack has not occurred does not prove that it was prevented by nuclear deterrence. One cannot prove a negative, that is, that doing something causes something else not to happen. That a nuclear attack has not happened may be a consequence of a number of factors, possibly simply good luck. And the more we learn about the Cuban Missile Crisis, the more convinced we should be that the absence of nuclear war was more the consequence of luck and good judgment. Some say the dangers of the current environment and their uncertainties strengthen the case for our continued reliance on nuclear weapons. That's an unfair summary, I think, of a lot of... Pauline's argument. As, as I deployed that argument myself and was partly responsible for, for the decision to renew the nuclear, uh, uh, the UK's nuclear deterrent in 2006, and I still do not support the unilateral abandonment of an independent UK deterrent, 
uh, I agree with that analysis, but only in the short term. The world is changing dramatically. And actually, part of the significant change in the world is the fact that we ourselves in the United Kingdom have disarmed to the tune of 75% since the end of the Cold War in relation to nuclear weapons. And just for those of you who are aficionados of the vocabulary of nuclear deterrence, we did all of this unilaterally. I know that's a bad word in the United Kingdom, but we did it all unilaterally. We never negotiated this with anybody. These were all unilateral decisions. But of course, you're not allowed in the mainstream of United Kingdom politics to be unilateral, because if you're a unilateralist, it guarantees you will never be in government, we're told. But this is not 2006. And the relevant factors have changed even since then, as have their significance, which is much more important. It's becoming clear that deterrence as a cornerstone of our defense strategy is decreasingly effective, and much more important, increasingly risky. As nuclear technology spread, it will become more difficult, not easier, to prevent acts of nuclear terrorism. I mean, I have more concern, I have to say, about a lorry with something in it than I have about the possibility of a ship. But either way, um, it will be an unconventional attack, I think, if these weapons are deployed and used. In 2006, I believe that our deterrent could play a role in deterring nuclear terrorism by threatening any state known to support it. But as the sources of material used for terrorism multiply, it will become more difficult to pinpoint the state responsible, not more easy. And if one cannot do that, one has no target for a credible threat of retaliation, as James pointed out. Uh, nuclear weapons are not physical defense. They're based upon the threat of retaliation. One cannot possibly retaliate against an enemy that one cannot locate. It's not credible to threaten to do so. So in the main, it doesn't work against terrorist organizations and as those who support them uh, increasingly appear to care less if tens of thousands or even millions of their own countrymen and women die, it will be largely ineffective in preventing nuclear terrorism or its sponsorship. Further, nuclear deterrence requires rational decision makers. There appears to have been a degree of predictable rationality between the main players during the Cold War. However, in the 21st century multipolar world with fewer nuclear weapons, but more uh, states in possession of them, and many of those states with unstable governments, and in the most unstable regions of the world, is it sensibly our expectation that the leaders of all nuclear armed states will behave rationally at all times? Particularly under conditions of extreme stress, can we be assured that they will behave, rational, that they will behave rationally at all times in the future, even if they will do it now? I think most rational and sane people believe the answer to these questions is an unqualified no. And we're seeing at the moment many examples of behavior across the world that suggest that that unqualified no um, is, is a more extreme and louder no day by day. It goes without saying that deterrence doesn't work against accidental use. If useful at all, it only works against the possibility of an intentional premeditated attack. Accidents happen. Uh, there is no such thing as a foolproof system. Ask the Americans who flew nuclear weapons across their country, not knowing that they were on the plane. In fact, the crew of the plane, not knowing they were on the plane, never mind anybody else knowing that they'd done this. And when nuclear weapons are involved, it seems to me extremely dangerous for us to begin to think there are foolproof systems that can control these weapons when we can't, in the most sophisticated countries in the world, control them at all times. Finally, deterrence in the current model that we deploy it encourages proliferation. To the extent that the theory of nuclear deterrence is valid and its flaws can be overlooked or dismissed, and I've enumerated some of them, but there are many more, it elevates nuclear weapons into the most valuable capability for the strategic protection of a country. Acceptance of nuclear deterrence theory is an incentive for nuclear proliferation. If it's what is necessary to keep a country safe, why shouldn't everyone want it? The primary purpose of our policy, I think, must be to ensure that we never suffer the consequence of a nuclear attack. And at this stage in our history, nuclear deterrence may have a residual role to play in achieving this objective, but the character of the 21st century threats means that its shelf life is eroding. If we want to be secure against nuclear and other threats, we have to think more creatively than our present reliance on deterrence implies. We have to shift the emphasis away from the threat of massive retaliation to prevention of nuclear catastrophe, and much more importantly, 
resilience in the face of any attack. The recent Oslo Conference on the Humanitarian Effects of Nuclear Weapons concluded worryingly that no country on earth has the resources to deal with the consequences of a nuclear war. We and the other P5 countries, of course, because we know better, boycotted that meeting. But we will have our opportunity in Mexico in 2014 to explain why all the world's best experts are wrong about this and what our plan for resilience in the face of any attack is. And if we're able to do that, that will be exceptionally helpful. Because we must plan for the unthinkable, but prevention is our main route to safety. Fewer nuclear weapons and materials in the world must be better than more of both. I mean, who thinks this is a less safe world because we have fewer chemical or biological weapons, fewer, hardly any deployed anti-personnel landmines, fewer, hardly any deployed cluster munitions, and if the arms trade treaty works, fewer small arms, the real weapons of mass destruction in the world, around the world. Disarmament leads to greater security, and it does with nuclear weapons as well as it does with any other weapon system. And I think those who argue the opposite are dangerously overconfident of our ability to keep control of nuclear weapons and materials, particularly in the face of terrorist ambitions. I think we've a duty to be honest about the narrowing relevance of nuclear deterrence to our strategic security, particularly if it means and allows reprioritization of resources, scarce resources, to prevention, defense, and resilience in the face of the other growing 21st century threats that are real and active in the world that we live in. If you expect me to be the Frenchman in the room, I'm probably going to be disappointing because the reason why I find this conversation so interesting is precisely because it exists. And it would probably not exist in that form in my country. So I thought I would actually build on some of the points that have been made and uh, offer basically three major, uh, an argument in three parts, let's say. My first point would be to say that when we're asked the question, do nuclear weapons deter? The first thing we have to realize is that we can actually never be sure of an, about an answer to that question. What we can actually know is specific cases in the past in which uh, deterrence based on nuclear weapons has failed. And that doesn't mean that they never did deter. But what that means is that actually a deterrent threat has never been made with nuclear weapons only. A deterrent threat is made by a leader, and the deterrent threat involves a whole set of capabilities on top of which we have nuclear weapons. So what we're confronted with is just kind of an skepticism on like how can we actually be sure of a case when nuclear weapons have deterred. And this skepticism leads us to basically uh, some interesting insights. So first one has been touched upon by Baroness Neville Jones is the issue of the stability and stability paradox. The second insight is the cases in which we know that we've avoided nuclear use out of luck, and there are cases in which luck can be boiled down to individual deterrence, like the individual was scared in the end, but there are cases in which it's clear <coughs> that the absence of nuclear use was sheer luck, and the Cuban Missile Crisis was mentioned. Uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, there is one moment when actually, uh, basically, planes over the Arctic uh, were meeting, I mean, uh, US planes and Soviet planes were meeting, and the US pilots were allowed to use nuclear weapons uh, to basically intercept their Soviet counterparts, and basically the planes never uh, reached each other because the Soviet plane went back, and we just don't know uh, why to this day. So that was my first point. We actually cannot be sure of when nuclear weapons alone deter or when they deter in general. All we can know is specific instances in which they failed. My second point will be to say that nuclear threats have a major credibility problem. It's really hard to convince your opponent that you're gonna use nuclear weapons against him or her. 
And what that means is that this credibility problems leads decision makers to take riskier strategies. The logic is, um, because we're facing a credibility problem, a deterrent threat and a nuclear threat is more credible when we're on the brink of disaster. So basically the idea of making a deterrent threat more credible leads leaders to, go, to get closer to the brink. And basically that assumes that we know where all the red lines are and we're really confident that we're not gonna go over them. My third point will be to say, basically, nuclear deterrence perpetuates what I would call global nuclear vulnerability. And this also has been touched upon. By that I mean, we still have no protection against a nuclear attack. And only the belief in a worldwide fail-safe fail technology solves the vulnerability problem. Because it's not only about our arsenal being safe. It's about any nuclear arsenal in the world that might target X or Y country being safe. Only this would basically put an end uh, to global nuclear vulnerability. And here I reach my conclusion, which is if you combine all those points, since we will never know for sure whether nuclear weapons have deterred in the past, since riskier nuclear strategies have been encouraged in the name of nuclear deterrence, and since the strategy of nuclear deterrence perpetuates the global nuclear vulnerability, the question worth asking would be, what would justify to continue global nuclear vulnerability into the future? In other words, are we prepared to trust technology coming in control worldwide so much that our populations would accept to expose themselves to unintended nuclear strikes. And this is not just a rhetorical question. This is actually a, a very important question because there was a time where there was an answer to that question. In December, and I'll end there. In 1959, when President Eisenhower met with the British ambassador, he said, I want you to realize that I would better be atomized than communized. So there was something worth dying for. The question is, what is it today?